hours. Uh, the purpose of this video is to answer the question, what is an object? This topic actually came about because earlier this year I was asked to do a presentation at Sales Kickoff about the product I work on at Hitachi Data Systems. And this product is called Hitachi Content Platform or, or HCP. And HCP is what's referred to as a distributed object store. But the guidance I was given at the time was to keep the presentation simple because f the feedback from sales was that object stores are exotic. And, and they didn't mean exotic good as in a tropical paradise. Uh, they meant exotic bad as in something complex and, and difficult to understand. And I can tell you that object stores are neither exotic nor arcane. But I think where much of the difficulty stems is in terminology. In any field, whether it's medicine, computer, uh, if it's a tech field, you're going to be bombarded with new terms. It's, it's just part of the territory. And I think much of the difficulty in understanding something unfamiliar is just getting used to the terminology used in that field. Once you do that, you discover that most things, they're, they're pretty readily understandable. So to understand what an object store is, we first have to understand what an object is. And then we can move on to the thing that houses these objects, which is called an object store. The term object is really an abstract term. It doesn't actually mean anything in particular. And this is on purpose, uh, because we really don't want to limit what an object can be. As soon as we name it to something specific, we've limited it. Uh, start with an example in the physical world. Let's say I want to talk uh, generically about a class of objects called motor vehicle. Uh, if I use instead a specific term, such as this is a Ford Thunderbird, then I've really limited the scope of what I can talk about. Uh, specificity has the advantage of being quite easy to conceptualize, but the disadvantage of constraining the scope. In other words, by calling the car object by a specific name, now that's all it can ever be. But if I use a more abstract term, such as motor vehicle, then I've instantly expanded the scope of what I'm able to talk about. I'm no longer limited to just a single make and model of car, but now by using a more abstract term, I can talk about any type of car I want. So I've already substantially expanded the set of things I can address simply by moving from the specific to the abstract. So on the plus side, abstraction is a very powerful thing because it, it doesn't impose artificial limits on our thinking. On the other hand though, Abstraction is harder to wrap our heads around than is the specific. And this gets worse uh, when you move in from the physical world, things such as cars, to the logical world of computer software. Uh, and the logical world is the domain of computer systems. So we always have to deal with that added complexity whenever we introduce new concepts. So let's transition from the physical to the logical of computer systems. Uh, but we'll start by narrowing this abstract term object down to something specific to help us understand what it is. And I think perhaps the most, uh, the computer object that's most readily uh, familiar to the greatest number of people is probably the digital image that we get when we take a photograph. Uh, in common terms, we call this picture a file. And digital cameras tend to label these files with names that aren't particularly useful to us as human users, but they provide an easy way for the camera itself to auto-generate unique names so that you don't end up with file name collisions. But what we see is an example of the machine doing things to make life easier for it than us as the user of that data. So whenever you take pictures, you're going to fill up a memory card with a bunch of files and with these seemingly arbitrary names. Here's an example of uh, the contents of a camera memory card I have. Uh, and you can see that while functional, this isn't terribly useful because I can't somehow easily discern which of these files represents a given picture. So one of the first things I do is import these files into some type of photo editing software such as iPhoto. Uh, iPhoto is an example of an object store. It stores these objects, called digital photographs, into a software system that allows us to then do useful things with them. And one of the prime values that such software brings is that it makes it easy for us to recognize what we're working with. Since we're no longer dealing with odd file names, such as we saw in the file system view, but instead can work with the object content itself. And that's, that's you're going to see, pretty key to an object store. Uh, OK, back to our picture. Let's build a first class object here. Uh, we'll begin with the file itself, which is the digital image. 
Next, we have the system metadata. And metadata just means data about data. Uh, and you can see here there's some common system metadata, such as the file name, when the file was created, and when was it last modified. This is pretty basic system metadata, and it's, and it's familiar, I think, to most computer users because you see it in file system views, such as Finder on the Mac or, or Windows Explorer on the PC. So if I jump back to our file system slide, this is the Finder on the Mac, which uh, we're using to take a look at the contents of the me memory card from the digital camera. And what you see here is we have seven files, each of which is a, is a picture. And you see the common system metadata, such as file name, the date last modified, the file size, and, and what type of file we're dealing with. So this is the typical file system view that we're used to seeing. And it's a very useful as an organizing function, particularly for small data sets like this. Uh, it, it tends to fail when we get to very, very large data sets because you can't simply view that and, can, and do anything useful. However, we want to convert these files to objects. So let's go back to our object build. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is add custom metadata, which is any arbitrary text that I want to attach to this object. And in this case, the first thing I'm going to do is, is give it a name. So uh, I'll call the, the model Lisa Simpson. Now I'll add where the picture was taken, um, categorize the photo to, in this case, family. And then I want to do some advanced functions that iPhoto doesn't presently support, but we'll assume this is going to a more sophisticated enterprise class object store. So I'll also say, don't delete this, and I want to allow photo sharing, uh, I'm sorry, allow sharing of this object. And there you have it. We've created a first class object that contains the three components of all objects. The file itself, which is also called the data, the system metadata, and the custom metadata. This ability to put whatever arbitrary text I want and attach it to this photograph makes the system far more useful to me uh, than it would be otherwise if I was just looking at the same data on a file system such as I have here, which is functional but not particularly easy to use because this was designed well before rich data content made its appearance on the scene. So going back to our object with its custom metadata, I hope that even in this simple example where I've added very little in the way of custom metadata, I hope you can see the usefulness of these data. Uh, the, the digital photographs are far more useful to me now that they're in an object store, in this case iPhoto. So what I'm hoping to show in this rather simple example, without going into a lot of technical deep dive detail, is just how important custom metadata is to rich data types. Without custom metadata, the value of my digital picture library would be reduced substantially. And I also hope you can see why it's a natural evolution to go from files, which began in the middle of, of last century, to objects, which are becoming the pr predominant data type uh, now. And you can refer to the video I did on structured versus unstructured data to get just how big a sense uh, of magnitude shift we're seeing in the storage business. Now, while it might not be obvious at first glance, uh, the value of custom metadata is so great that it actually exceeds the value of the data itself over time. And here's an example of what I'm talking about here. This is a screenshot of my iPhoto library, and I have over 4,000 photos to date. Uh, let's say I'm looking for a particular photo that includes my kids. Now, there's no way that it's efficient at all for me to visually search through 4,000 photos in the hopes of finding the picture I want. Uh, further, I, I couldn't possibly do this by trying to guess what cryptic name the camera decided to assign to these pictures. So I need the custom metadata just to give me the basic functionality of being able to search my own photo library for the photo that contains my kids. So right off the bat, we can see that custom metadata is simply essential to making rich data useful. However, I asserted earlier that the value of custom metadata is greater than the value of data itself over time. So how do I justify this assertion? Well, because software continually evolves. It used to be in Ida Photo that I could do searches against custom metadata, which is useful, but I really want the software to do these functions for me. So in recent uh, releases, they added the ability to automatically traverse your photo library and using facial recognition software to create views of all the people in your photo library and do so automatically without me doing any work. 
Now, there were many, many releases of iPhoto over the many, many years that never had this type of functionality. But the beauty of allowing users from the beginning to enter custom metadata with their pictures is that as the software evolved and grew smarter, it could use the custom metadata to do interesting things uh, that make not only, these not only make my user experience better, but it actually increases the usefulness of the data itself. Photos I can't find are of no use to me. Uh, the data itself only has value if I can find it and use it. And custom metadata is what allows us to do sophisticated and interesting operations against the data. So that's what I mean by the value over time. I, I can't predict for you right now what will be the next cool feature we develop in five years. But I can say that if your objects either don't have custom metadata associated with them or you can't inject custom metadata at some point, it's very likely that at least some advances in technology are going to pass you by. Now earlier we said that object is an abstract term. And as such, without any context, it really doesn't mean anything in particular. To help make this abstract term, term concrete, we began by defining one particular instance of an object, such as a digital picture. Uh, and then we went on to show how to make this object more useful through custom metadata, uh, custom metadata coupled with uh, object storage software. But now that we've gone through that exercise, we can move from the particular to the general and state that an object can really be any file type from office file types such as word processing, PowerPoint, to music, pictures, movies, medical images, uh, and objects virtually from every other vertical such as oil and gas. Um, further, to take full advantage of the rich richness of data as it evolves from the basic file types that we saw in the last century to the rich file types we see today, we require some type of software system to enable us to do things that go beyond looking at file names in a, in a window. And that software is generally referred to as an object store. So in the generic sense, an object is any file type except a database. So I think for this reason, that's why you hear people often, often using the terms object and unstructured data as synonyms. So there you go. Uh, that's the definition of the term object is used at least in the computer storage realm. I hope this video, uh, I was able to get across a few points. Number one, the power of objects over files alone. Two, I hope this helped explain why objects are a natural evolution over the basic file types that we saw in the last century. And finally, I hope that I showed that objects are not exotic. Okay, in the next video, we'll talk about the software systems called object stores that have sprung up to house these new data types. Uh, and I hope this was helpful, and thanks for tuning in.